the shadow of death. You're preparing a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be afraid. Cause when you open my eyes, I see you making way. Oh, so with every breath I have within me, I will lift up and glorify. If you're going through something right now, could you just lift your hands to heaven? You can declare that right now. Lord, the word, the word says that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. You may look. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look Thank you, Jesus. You're here today. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you say that I kind of feel like I'm in the middle of something. Doesn't matter what it is. I'm not even asking you to say what it is. I'm not even asking you to be like, oh yeah, it's finances or oh yeah, my health. Or, but you feel like you're in the middle of a fight right now. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. If you're new here, this is just kind of the way we roll, okay? We're glad you're with us. The scripture says that the house of the Lord is a house of prayer. So we believe that and we walk in that. So when we feel like the Lord's moving us into a time of prayer, that's just what we do. Okay? So if you're here today and you would just be honest and say, I feel like I'm in the middle of a fight spiritually. I feel like I'm in the middle of something. And you'd like somebody to come and pray with you. Now, we won't attack you, but we'd be happy to come and pray with you. But if that's you, I want you to stick a hand up and say, I feel like I'm going through it right now. Come on. I have one, two, three, four. Okay, keep your hand up. People who are around you, those that you have your hand up, keep them up. If there's somebody around you, I want you to start finding people. Just begin to pray. Worship teams will keep playing. They're going to keep singing. We're going to bring the volume up in just a second. But just start praying now. It doesn't have to be comfortable. For some of you, this might be new, and that's okay. Make sure everybody has somebody. I just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. Just bring the volume up and say, Cause this is how I my battle. This is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. Give me look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. 
Somebody say, praise the Lord. If, if you want to be seated, you can. I'm the worship team's going to keep going for a minute because I'm not ready to transition quite yet. say anything to me okay I just I just want to you bring all the music down just a little bit you guys keep playing it's awesome thank you I'm the type of person that just like if I feel like the Holy Spirit put something on my heart I'm just gonna say it and I will say this to you I'll just leave it with you don't worry I'm not gonna say anything that's gonna embarrass you okay <laughs> like don't don't worry about that there are times where the Lord will allow us to go through dry seasons and frustrating moments. Hey, can we all, can we all, I know that, I know there's kids in the room. It's okay, listen, the kids will be a little rumbly. I ain't worried about that, I'm worried about the adults, okay? The Lord will let us go through dry times. You see that with people all throughout scripture. Strong men and women of God that go through those stretches where it's like, God, I have no clue. Does that make any sense? Times where you get to the point where you want to wag your fist at God and be like this. I thought the word said that you would bless me. I thought, but I don't feel that right now. The only thing I have for you is two words, okay? Not two words, but two things to say. All the people in the church that come here normally, you all know that. I thought Mike was preaching today. Some of you are thinking the first thing is you're not the only one who's had to walk through it. The enemy tries to isolate you and make you think that when you're walking through something that nobody knows your pain. Nobody knows what that feels like. That's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy. And I'm going to tell you something else. In the middle of the junk and in the middle of the frustration, in the middle of the fights and the arguments and the disagreements and everything else that we might walk through. You know, we were singing a little bit about that, but Psalm 23 
He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Listen, he's not asking you to figure it out. He's asking you to sit at the table and eat. Amen. He's asking you to sit at the table and eat. It's that simple. He says the food's already there. And it's better than anything we can come up with anyway. Trust me. I've tried too. I've tried them on straight. He'll take care of that. I've heard this said way better than I could articulate it. But the growth is where, uh, the valley is where growth happens. So if you feel like you're in the valley, the Lord is going to use that. He takes everything that the enemy meant for evil and he turns it to good. Just keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Listen, I promise you, I don't know. You can do with this whatever you want, all right? I promise you he didn't tell me nothing, okay? I promise he didn't tell me anything. So I don't, that's between all y'all, okay? Listen, I'm going to pray. Can we extend a hand? Can we extend a hand really quick right now? Lord, I want to thank you. What's your name, brother? Robert? Listen, my, na- my name's Aaron, so you could go, you can go either way with that. So that's okay. Just extend a hand to Robert and Corey. Lord, we thank you for Robert and Corey. And Lord, we, we say that over their lives. We say that anything that the enemy has meant for evil, that you're turning it for good right now. That you brought them here today simply to remind them that it doesn't matter what they're walking through, that you're there. You're with them. There's a, there's a fourth man in the fire, and that's you. And they don't have to worry. They will not be burned. We say Philippians 1, 6 over them. Lord, that you who have begun a good work in them will be faithful to complete it. That what you start, you always finish. And it doesn't matter how far you feel you've gone or how many stupid things you feel like you've done. There's always restoration because he is hungry to go after the one sheep that's lost, the one that's in the ditch, the one that's hurting. So we bless him. And I pray that for everybody else here this morning that might feel that way. For everybody else who, we didn't call them out by name, but they are feeling the exact same thing. Lord, we pray in your name that your peace would sweep over every heart, every mind, and every spirit. We say in Jesus' name, every lie of the enemy is canceled. Every plan of the devil is now destroyed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that, God. We give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. At this point, the kids are dismissed. There's no pretty way to transition, so we're just going to do it. All right? We love the kids and those who volunteer. Can we give them a hand as they go today? We do have a couple of announcements. I'm going to get my commercial out of the way, and then I'm going to hand it over to Bree for a moment because... Next week starts something super, super important. So if you're awake, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're not awake, I have no idea how. (laughs) You're sleeping. Praise the Lord. Just a few things to touch base on. Um, I don't even know what slides are on the screen, but we'll walk through them together. Caden, how about that for the announcements? Uh, Our next prayer and praise night is this Thursday. Somebody say prayer and praise night. night. It's this Thursday. Okay? So we're going to be here. Eat at 6. Listen, it's a free meal. How many of you like free food? Get real. Every single person in this room should have said amen. Tacos, I think, right? Somebody feel the Holy Ghost? I did. I just felt the Lord. The presence of the Lord was already here, but it just came in in a new way. 6 o'clock we'll be here. Uh, anyone is free to come to that. There's no charge. It's not like that. It's just food. And then what's going to happen after that, 7 o'clock, if you have never been to one of our prayer and praise nights, it's simple. It's a night of praise and worship. We set up a microphone somewhere in this area, and if somebody feels something that they would like to lead prayer over, uh, it could be anything, you know, the government, it could be finances, it could be, you know, you fill out with anything, family, you know, personal things we keep personal, but something that could be led from a corporate context we leave a microphone there and we participate that way so it's a mixture of exactly what is tiled prayer and praise Uh, so we have that going on there's a men's breakfast coming up something else that's important there's a sign up it's not going to be behind me there's a sign up on the bulletin board out there to be a 10 caps game that the men are going to uh, and uh, your sons are also able to go to that if you'd like to do that just a guys gathering and it's a good time and i'm telling you right now they will load you up with food at this thing it's unbelievable uh, so, it's like, why does every announcement have food involved today? I just kind of, um, 
But other than that, there are other things going on. Um, I'm sure there might be some other stuff behind me on the screen. But I wanted to take some time because next week on Sunday, something very important starts. And uh, it's been a hectic and a crazy time. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, before Sunday hits, that we have a moment to give preparation for the people of the church to be praying about this. So I'm going to have uh, Bree Reinhardt come just share a little bit about what's coming up starting Sunday. You'll see a lot of uh, maybe unfamiliar faces here Sunday, and she's going to tell you why. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> I haven't even said anything yet. Um, so a week from today, we will take 30 volunteers, um, some from this church, but honestly a lot from just other churches in the community um, that have trained and prayed and been just hard at work for like the past year. We'll take all 30 of us, and then we take 20 kids out of the foster care system here from our local community, and we take them to our Royal Family Kids Camp. And if you don't know what that is, that's why I'm standing up here to tell you what it is real quick. Um, our Royal Family Kids Camp is, in a sense, it's a very traditional summer camp. We canoe, we swim, we sing, we do crafts, we, we scorch in the heat, there's no air conditioning, we're in cabins. It's fantastic for some of us. <laughs> But we, um, you know, we, we use this opportunity to show these children the, the, the most vulnerable of us, um, oftentimes the lost, the forgotten. We take this week to teach them about God, sometimes for the first time. Um, they've been beat up in life, sometimes very physically, by fathers and mothers. And we get to take this week to teach them that there is a heavenly father that loves them and that will not beat on them and that will be there for them. Um, so going into this week um, and going into next week, I just want to ask if we could just be praying about it. We're ready to go. We've got our volunteers. We've got our activities. We've got our food. We've got our bacon set up every single morning for breakfast. Like, we're good to go. <laughs> but this week leading in, you know, Satan always tries to attack our families and our kids and our volunteers. Pray for the families. Um, pray that the kids that are with our babysitters for the week, pray for the babysitters, okay, that are keeping our children Pray for the kids that are coming to camp. Pray that God just opens their heart to feel the love that we're trying to give them and to hear and, and feel God's love that we're trying to show them for the first time and pray for the volunteers. And um, I know it's going to be amazing. We didn't get to have camp last year, and I feel like God's just been storing up everything awesome he wanted to do last year, and he's like doubling it this year. I can feel it already. It's going to be amazing. So if you guys could just pray with us, that's just, uh, that's gonna, it's just going to make it work for us. So thank you. Dang it. Well, hey, we're asking you, we're asking you to pray this week, so we're gonna start by praying now, right? So let's just let's take a moment to pray right now. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, every bit of what this camp represents. First and foremost, that it is a Christ-centered camp. That these kids are gonna hear the gospel. Uh, so, Lord, I'm praying first and foremost that everything that happens uh, in our lives, in the camp, and for our children and family members who are uh, staying behind in one way or another, I pray that Jesus would be lifted up and glorified. I pray that there would be testimonies that would come from camp and that we would receive testimonies when we come back from camp and we see our family members who didn't actually get to participate. Uh, Lord, that you would keep everyone safe. That you'd keep everyone healthy. But we speak against any negative plan, anything that would try to come against or hinder the camp or the family members of those who are participating in the camp. We speak a hedge of protection around them. We speak your peace, your health, your joy. And Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do starting next week. And we pray right now. I'm, I'm asking, Lord, that, that, that you would move in a mighty way. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bree, for sharing. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, this camp will mess you up. It really will. These kids, one minute you're ready to hug them, the next minute you're not. That's probably the <laughs> nicest way I'm going to say it. But by the time Friday rolls around, you are, um, you need sunglasses when the kids leave. It just is what it is. And uh, so I'm, I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Even though I'm praying for the weather report to be a little cooler, we're just going to see what the Lord does. If he can move mountains, he can bring it down about 10 or 15 degrees. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Come on. Um, so I'm not going to do a big introduction for our speaker this morning. There are a lot of you who could do that better than I can. Uh, I've had some discussions with him, and yesterday was actually the first time we met face-to-face. -face. And uh, if i got to be honest with you, there, there's, there was a, at least I'm not going to speak for him, okay? But I, I just felt an instant like this is, this is a good brother. This is somebody who's hungry for the things of God. This is a guy who spiritually was birthed out of this place, so to speak, and I'll let him share more about that. I won't steal his notes or anything, 
Uh, but I, I'm very much looking forward to what he has to share. And my prayer all along has been that what he has will be a blessing and that we can be a blessing to him and to his family and the ministry that God is working out through them. I want to tell you this just in advance because we all know how things get sometimes when we open the altars. So I'm just going to get this commercial out of the way now. If you would like to give, whether it's a check or the card or whatever else, if you write a check, write it to the church, and in the memo, put guest speaker. If you want to give on the card machine, there's a guest speaker tab on there that you can hit. And we will make sure that everything that you give will go for him. I'll also say that if for some reason uh, you want to give a, a cash offering for them, just let, uh, or Lauren, I believe you'll be, either Lauren or Mike will be at the back door with the bucket on your way out. Just let them know, hey, this is for the speaker for today. Um, I, I know that's not really a super spiritual thing or a way to go about it, but I want to make sure we handle that before he preaches and we open the altars and then who knows what's going to happen, right? So I'm going to ask Brother Mike Order to come and uh, don't call him his nickname. We've retired that. We've retired that. Don't do that to him. But listen, let's welcome Mike today. Oh, man. Okay, I need to calm down for a second. Um, I'm hopped up on the Holy Spirit and caffeine. I've had like five shots of espresso today, so I'm ready to go. Um, uh, like Pastor Aaron said, man, uh, my name is Mike, and for some of you guys do know me. Um, for some of you guys who don't, uh, this place to me is holy ground. And I don't give a lot of places that title in my life. I'm not going to cry. Stop. Um, uh, but it was right here. It was right here when... Uh, I walked into these doors as a 14-year-old chubby kid with no game, uh, and I gave my life to Christ for the very first time. It was right here where this foot pedal sits. Um, I told you I'm not going to cry. Stop. And so uh, I, uh, I just want to say, Aaron, and thank you to you and your family. Thank you for having me, man. It is an honor to be here. Um, I'm very... I get to share the stage with giants, man. I get to stand on the shoulders of giants. So uh, for those of you guys who are uh, maybe new here, just the very first time, um, this, what, what happens in this church is not normal. It should be, but it's not normal. This is a very special place, and I'm very grateful and honored to be here. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm very honored and blessed to be here. Um, but like I said, came into this place when I was 14, chubby and no game. I am now 32 years old. I'm like the weird cousin you've never met and now we're meeting. I'm 32 years old, a little less chubby and lots of game. So I'm going to show you a picture of my family to prove my point. I think we might have a picture of my family, maybe. There they are. So that is my beautiful wife, Tiffany. We will be married 11 years in November. Uh, that is my, I know, right? Holla. Uh, that is my daughter, Isla. She, don't let the smile fool you. She will judo chop your neck if you give her the chance. Uh, but she just turned eight, and that is my brute of a son named Banner. Yes, like Bruce Banner. We named him after the Hulk, and he is always angry. Uh, and uh, he just turned five. So that is my family. Unfortunately, they could not be here today because they're holding it down back home. Um, but they're very, very grateful that you allowed me to be here. So uh, I want to get into this. I really believe, guys, I have went through so much prayer for this um, because I really wanted God to speak, and I really wanted God to show up, and I don't want it to be me. I want it to be all his words. So before we get into the message, I'm going to pray. Will you guys just pray with me? Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you. So I am so humbled and honored to be here, Lord, to be with your people, to share the word that I believe you have given me to share. So God, I just pray for open hearts. God, I pray for open hearts and open minds um, to receive what you have to say. God, not my words, your words. So if there's anything inside of me, Lord Jesus, that shouldn't be shared, then silence me, God. But I pray right now that it would just be fertile soil that your word goes out into and gets planted, God, to bring forth fruit, Lord. We love you so much, Jesus. We give you all the glory for what you did for us. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. And the church said, amen. amen. Okay, so we are going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Starting in verse 5, and I know what you're thinking, yes, millennials still read the Old Testament and still find it relevant, okay? So we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5, but before we do that, I need to give you context in what I'm speaking about today. So I'm going to be real short in this backstory. I'm going to talk about a man named Jehoshaphat, okay? Apparently his parents didn't like him very much because they named him Jehoshaphat, all right? So, but Jehoshaphat is very important, and why is because he is the king of Judah, and in this context and what we're talking about, the king of Judah right now is trying to bring Israel and Judah, Jerusalem and Judah, the nation of Israel together under the banner of God. He's trying to establish some order. He's trying to put some judges into place to make this chaos controlled, 
And there's a lot of people who are taking notice of what God is trying to do through this man, and they don't like it. How many of you guys know the moment you try to take a step in following God, sometimes the enemy rises up and doesn't like it? So here we have three different armies that are coming against Jehoshaphat, and they are declaring war against them. We have the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Meunites. Again, awful names, okay? But we have three different armies, three different kings, three different nations coming against Jehoshaphat. They have now declared war on this man of God, and it actually says in Scripture that he got scared. Because sometimes when things hit the fan, it gets a little scary sometimes. So we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5-12, through 12, and this is what it says. Don't worry if you don't have a Bible. I'm sure there's going to be some, some words up on the screen. It says, it says, Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out those who live in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here. Built this temple to honor your name, they said. Whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. Thank God for his promises like that in Scripture. That we can come before the temple where his name is honored. This place was built to honor his name. And it says that we can come before him. We can cry out to him. We can give him our situation and he will hear us and rescue us. And it says this. It says, and now you see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you give us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. When I was praying, guys, I was praying. I was fasting. I, was did, I did everything a good little AG boy knew how to do to prepare for this message. And when I was asking the Lord, I said, God, what do you want to say? This phrase stuck out to me. I do not know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. I don't know about you, but I have been there so many times where I've been standing before God and was like, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Now, I don't want to be the preacher that gives 2020 any more power than it already has taken from us. But here's the thing. There's very real residual effect from that year that people even right now are still going through. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family. We have lost loved ones. We've lost jobs because of stuff that went on in that year. There's been moments where people have said, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Just to give you guys some history about me and my family, uh, me and my wife got married when we were uh, 21. We were, we were pretty young when we got married. Um, and I had just graduated a third year of a discipleship program. I was a certified pastor of the Assemblies of God. I was ready to go out and do the work. I was like, man, let's go. Jesus, you did the work for three years. I went to school for three years. Like, you fulfilled your promise. Well, I'm going to fulfill my promise now. Like, it's going to be great. And then I got married. And then God said, no, you need to take some time. And you just need to be you and work on your marriage and, and build your relationship up with your wife. I said, oh, okay. I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Like, you got me, right? And so for, I worked at Starbucks. She worked at David's Bridal. We just did our thing for a little while. And then I remember it was about eight months into our marriage. We were approached by Tiffany's cousin who had planted a church in northern Wisconsin. And he asked us if we would pray about coming and being part of the team. And I was like, no, I'm not going. It's northern Wisconsin, Packer country. I'm not going. <laughs> not going. And so through a lot of my own insecurity and pride because here's the thing, when I would go there, if I chose to go there, no position awaited me, but the position was for my wife. And so I was like, okay, God, and, and he hit me with this truth. He goes, okay, listen, son, you want to know how to serve your bride? What did I do to my bride? I died for her. You die to yourself and you go. Okay. Right? So I went. We stayed there for three and a half years. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And in those three and a half years, at one point, our daughter was six months old. 
Uh, my wife was full-time kids pastor, which meant I was full-time kids pastor because you just inherit what your wife would be doing. And so, uh, guys, there are so many incriminating videos of me as different characters, okay, just floating around in the ether of the internet. At one point, I had to become a character named Pruka von Schmidt, and that's exactly how I talked for the whole kids series, okay? Um, don't look it up. I promise you it's not worth it. Um, but so at one point, my daughter's six months old. My wife is full-time kids pastor, so I'm involved in the kids ministry. Also, I'm full-time youth pastor for that year, unpaid, full-time every single Wednesday, coming up with stuff for the youth to do. And then on top of that, I was working 40-plus hours a week at a factory in town just to make a living for the family. And on top of all that, every single Sunday, me and my wife would split. She would take the kids, and I would go to a church 30 minutes away and preach for them because they had no pastor to fill the pulpit. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And after, a lot, and after that season was up, I, I talked to our pastor in the church that I was preaching at, actually wanted me to, and my wife to take over as lead pastors. I was 24 at the time. And this was a 100-year-old Presbyterian church <laughs> in Crivets, Wisconsin, which also sounds like an STD. <laughs> Crivets, okay? You don't really want to pastor in Crivets, but God told me go to Crivets, Okay. And so here I am, 24 years old, Hispanic, tatted up, and I'm in an all-white community in Crivets, Wisconsin. One of these doesn't look like the other, okay? Like, it was awkward. It was so awkward. But God moved, and it was crazy, and God did amazing things. Guys, when I started there, we had 25 people. When I ended there, we almost had 140. God was moving, and people would ask me, what are you doing? I said, praying a lot, bro. Praying a lot. You don't even understand. But... Time went on, and I, I really, they were, they were kind of holding uh, really, really true to, to who the God had created the church to be and really felt passionate about. So I said, okay, well, then you need a pastor in here that can honor what you guys believe in all this stuff, and so let me help you. So I actually was on the committee. They put me on the committee to find another pastor to come in. So I stayed until we found one. He's there to this day, and me and him, me and him have an amazing relationship. It's, it's beautiful. They're healthy. It's awesome. But in that, uh, we felt transition, obviously, had no job. So what, then you're in transition. So then God called me back to the mega church in Illinois where I did my schooling to, and I was there for two years as spiritual discipleship and travel director at, the, at this big mega church there. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. You need to help me. You need to show me. And in the middle of that time, we had our son, Banner. My wife uh, suffered with postpartum depression, and things just got real. So I had to take a step back. I left that ministry position because my family is, first and foremost, my main ministry. So I left that position, and we worked at Starbucks, opposite shifts, back at it, making lattes for stuck-up people. It was awesome. <laughs> it was great. Loved it. Pretty good at it, actually. But we, we were working opposite shifts, so I, I, I would go, and for an entire year, we worked there, and I would work the open shift, which if you know what time Starbucks opens, they open at 4.30. So if you work there and you work the open shift, you have to show up at least by 4 a.m. Jesus isn't even up at that time, okay? <laughs> Ungodly time. So I would work 4 a.m. I'd get home at 1. My wife, we would tag up, and she would leave, and she'd go to work. And so then that was how we lived life for an entire year. Ships passing in the night, things. We would make it work as, as best we could. But, God, I don't know what to do. You called me in the full-time ministry. You're like, yeah, you've commissioned me. You've anointed me. What am I doing working at Starbucks making lattes for Susie? I don't get it, God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And then about a year in, I felt like God called me to do the most crazy thing I had ever felt like he had called me to do. He asked me and my wife to move our entire family of four within two months to Southern California to help with the church plant again. We had, had knew no one except the pastor and his wife. We have no family, no friends out there, but God asked us to go, so you just go. Side note, it's going to turn out really well for you if you just do what God has asked me to do. So we went. And it was, it was cool because we had housing lined up, we had jobs lined up, and so we get there, and all this is two days after my wife gets there because I get there first, set everything up. Two days after we get there, housing falls through, jobs falls through. Y'all ever been to Southern California? It's expensive, Okay. So here's my family of four. At the time, I'm 29 years old. I'm a man, 29 years old. Why are you laughing? That's messed up. But I'm, but I'm 29 years old, and, and me and my wife and my two kids live in one room of a house for an entire year in Southern California where it is too hot to run the air con or too expensive to run the air conditioner. 
we were hotboxing each other all the time in that room. And I just remember, God, what are you doing? What am I supposed to do? God, I'm a man. I'm supposed to provide for my family, and I can't even give us our own space. Guys, we lived in Southern California with our pastor. So it was me, my wife, our two kids, him, his wife, and their two kids. We all lived together for three years. Because when God asks you to do something, you just do it even though you may not understand or have clarity to what it's going to happen. And it was year two that I really felt like God was leading me and my family in, into something new. I thought he was going to ask us to stay. They're like, man, you move a lot. I do move a lot, and it's not my fault, okay? <laughs> but I remember God was like, I want you to take every single experience you've ever had in Rockford, Illinois, northern Wisconsin, southern California, Indiana. I want you to take all of that experience working with all kinds of economic uh, uh, and, and racial divides. I want you to take all that experience, and guess what, Mike? I want you to move you, your wife, and your two beautiful kids to the most, statistically, the most segregated economically and racial city that we have in America, downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I want you to start a church, and I want you to go tell people about me. I told you I'm not going to cry, so I'm not. Stop looking at me. Um, and so that's what we did. With the blessing of our pastor, they launched us out like crazy, and it was amazing. I love them. And we're, they're on our board and all this stuff. It's great. So we moved to downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to start a church. I don't know what to do, God, but I'm looking to you for help. So we have these mom this moment where these nations, three kings, three different nations, three different armies declare war on Jehoshaphat. And it's crazy because when this happens, Jehoshaphat has one thing he does. He gathers up everybody. He gets the kids, the wives, the, the neighbors that annoy you, your coworkers that you're frustrated with. He gets everybody together and goes, listen, we need to pray, we need to fast, and we need to seek God together because it's about to go down. We need some help. So everyone gets And here's the jacked up thing. God doesn't even give Jehoshaphat the message. Have you guys ever been praying for something and all of a sudden someone else gets the word that you were looking for? It's frustrating, isn't it? So all of a sudden, here comes now this guy who has the message. His name is Jaheel, but I'm going to call him Bob because I hate saying Jaheel. So Bob comes and the man with the plan, he says, hey, look, I got it. Don't worry. I know what God's saying. He's saying, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid of this mighty army. Oh. Oh, so you're admitting that they're also a mighty army. Sick, man. Sometimes Christians give the worst advice. I see you're going through it, brother, and I see it, and if I see it, God sees you're going through it. Really, bro? Because I feel like God needs bifocals because it's real in these streets, and I'm hurting. Does he actually see me? And so Jehoshaphat gets this message from Bob, and he says, yo, don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Listen, God's got you. And this is actually what it says in 2 Chronicles 20, uh, 16 through 17. This is what Bob says. He says, tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens up in the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, pull out your swords, ready up your shields, get your, your, your arrows and your quivers, get all that stuff. Uh, take your positions, get ready to fight like you've never fought before. Wait. That's not what that says. It says, take your positions and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He's with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. So let me get this straight, Bob. Army's coming. From this side, from this side, from this side. We have three armies that are coming against us. And not just me, man, like all of my people, my, the, the cousins and the uncles and the brothers and the sisters and the mothers and the children, like all these armies are coming with me and you just want us to stand still and watch. See, sometimes, sometimes we get the answer, but it's just not the one we want. Sometimes, God, you're praying so much. You're asking God so much, especially within these last few months. You're asking so much. God, I need an answer. I need an answer. I need an answer. And here's the thing. God's probably already given you the answer. It may not be the answer you want, and it also may not be from who you want it to be from. So I have a question for you. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Do you face your situation and your problem in your own strength and in your own might, or do you actually let God resolve it for you and believe that he's good for it? 
We talk a big, if we're really honest, we talk a really big game in church about trusting and having faith in God. But when stuff hits the fan, so many times we're wanting to take up our own shield and our own strength and our own sword, and we want to go to war. Because it's easy to move in action. It's really hard to just stand still. Why do you think scripture says that sometimes he forces you to lie down in green pastures? Because we don't want to. We're stubborn that way. What's crazy is I did a little research a few chapters prior in Chronicles 7, uh, tw- uh, 17, chapter 17, it actually gives you a numerical count of the army Jehoshaphat had in his back pocket. See, so when you read this passage, you're like, I'm, I'm sure he was scared. I, does he even have an army? Oh, he did. And it was actually a really big army. Matter of fact, if you actually do the math, it says that his army was roughly 1,160,000 people deep. 1,160,000 people deep. To put that in perspective, as of 2020, the numbers for our U.S. Army, now this is including the, the regular Army, the Army National Guard, and the Army Reserve. As of 2020, they only had 1,005,000. So he had 150, roughly 155,000 more people in his army than we have in our current army. What's crazy is in Scripture, God did a lot more with a lot less. Remember Gideon? 300,000 people? 300? This is Jerusalem. Like, that's how it should have gone down. You know what I mean? But God's done a lot more with a lot less. So what did Jehoshaphat do? He could have marched out with his own army and been like, yo, I got the numbers. We, it ain't nothing. Let's see what we got. And, and according to scripture, these were mighty men trained in war. Like, these were bad men. Spec ops kind of guys. But this is what Jehoshaphat did. He says, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18, it says this. It says, then King Jehoshaphat rallied the troops, gave a really great speech, and then kept on marching. No, that's not what it says. It says, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. So what did Jehoshaphat do when he didn't know what to do? What should we do when we don't know what to do? My first point is this. So in the middle of his worry, Jehoshaphat took a posture of worship. So here's your first, your first thing. When you're in the middle of you don't know what to do, and you're in the middle of your worry, take a posture of worship. I, I've been told all the time, man, in speaking classes, they have those preaching classes, they have those. And they're like, when you preach, give a tangible thing, something that people can physically do so that it's easy for them. Okay? I don't know how much more tangible you want to get when it says take a posture of worship. So when he says that they worship the Lord, this is what the word actually means according to the original language. It means to bow self down, to crouch, fall down flat, humbly beseech, do in reverence and worship. It's a physical act. We want a tangible thing. I don't know how much more tangible it gets than to do this. You heard my knees cracking, I'm old. (laughs) This is what it means to worship in the middle of your worry. Not to face it in your own strength, but to actually get on your knees and physically posture yourself to declare that he is always greater than you. If we really do buy into this thing that he's the king of the universe, if we really do buy in that he's God who holds the world in his hand, then we should physically posture ourselves sometimes in worship. It goes on to say this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Verse 20 through 21, it says this. It says, early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his splendor. This is, what, this, this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. So on the way to battle, he told them to believe. On the way to battle, he told them to believe. Now, this word believe is really interesting to me because it's actually broken down into two different words in the original meaning. The first one is y'all men, and the second one, or the, uh, y'all mean, and the second word is all men. The first word, y'all mean, means, uh, in the original language, it means right hand. Well, that's interesting right hand, okay? What's the second part mean? The second part means to support or have faith in. 
to support or have faith. But what's interesting about the right hand is the right hand historically has always been the hand of action. So soldiers, when they would march out and they would have their shield in their left hand or their left arm, and they would always carry their sword in their right hand because the right hand is always the hand of action. Where's Jesus sitting right now? At the right hand of the Father, waiting to come back. So what Jehoshaphat is telling his people is after we get done posturing ourselves in a physical act of worship, now what our chance to do is we have to act in faith. Act in faith. So here's the second thing if you're taking notes. In the midst of fear, act in faith. When you don't know what to do, in the midst of fear, act in faith. This is the spiritual act. We already covered the physical. Now this is the spiritual. We are both physical and spiritual beings. Some of you may be like, ah, Mike, it's not that easy to have faith, man. I'm not a faith person. I really don't have that much faith. Like, I don't have as much faith as the person next to me. I'm going to discredit all of that right now. I'm going to prove with a very simple uh, analogy that every single person in this room has the exact same amount of faith as every other person in this room. You ready? You ready? You sure? There's no going back. You're held accountable to what you know. No going back. You ready? Okay. I was paying attention. Not one person, when you walked in to sit down, checked the welds on your chair to see if it would hold your weight. (laughs) Not one person. You just sat down. Because why? You trusted in your truster that the weight was gonna that the weight was gonna be held by the chair. You had what? Faith. You didn't think about it. You just sat down. And some of you are more willing to put your faith in a chair than your faith in God. I know this stuff hurts, but here's the thing: the only reason I'm standing up here with this microphone is because God preached it to me first. None of you got down and was like, I wonder if these welds will hold. <laughs> None of you did it. You just had faith. So here's the thing. It's not about if you have faith. You all have faith. It's not even about how much faith you have because all of you have the exact same amount of faith as everyone else. It's about what you're putting your faith in. Some of you are putting your faith. Can we just be real, man? This, this last year, was, it revealed a lot. I think that's a really good thing. It revealed a lot about our hearts, our intentions, our motives, our faith systems, our belief systems, the structures in which we cling to things. Man, we put our rest and our, and our ease and our peace in the hands of a political party. Can I just... Jesus was Middle Eastern. He doesn't have one. I know that may be really offensive to some people in here, and I'm sorry, but Jesus was born in Nazareth, not in America. What are you putting your faith in? The reason why you... I'm going to read this because I need... I feel like this was something that the Lord... The reason why you might be so overwhelmed right now with what you're facing is because there is nothing physically you can do about it. You might be trying so hard to correct and to fix something that God wants to show you he's going to take it from you. He wants to fight for you. But do you actually have faith that he values you that much? What's crazy is, and I fall subject to this too, guys, I will preach someone's ear off about how much God loves them, but I will go into my own prayer closet doubting the same thing for myself. You guys need to believe and have faith that God actually sees you, knows you by name, and knows how many hairs are on your head. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 22 through 24 says this, and I'm going to wrap up, so if the worship team can come up and make me sound more spiritual, that'd be great. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 22 through 24 says like this. It says, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies, or allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, and all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemies had escaped. So here they are thinking that, okay, we're going we're gonna to go out. Put this in context. We're going to go out. 
We're going to expose ourselves. We're going to give away our tactical advantage. They're going to see exactly where we are because we're cresting the hill. And then we're actually just going to stand there. And hopefully we see, we see what God is going to do. Hopefully he shows up and hopefully he does something amazing. And by the time they got there, he had already done it. But you know what's crazy about that? It says at the very moment, at the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. God already did it. Before they even got to the hill, he already did it. So not only did God take care of it, but he did it in a way that exceeded their expectation. And this is not a sugar stick message of like, oh, if you just do this, then God will do this. No, sometimes you still have to march out against the army. And there's still an army facing you down. So it's not the fact that the army went away. The threat was very real. But God's solution was even better than that army. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he did it for them, he's going to do it for you. Can you imagine how much tangible faith it took for, for my man Jeho over here to actually take all of Judah and Jerusalem to march out and just expose every single person he loved and cared for? Think about it's not easy. So I'm not negating of what you're going through in the battle you're about to go and march head on into and just, just stand there. I know it's going to be real for you. But can you place your faith instead of in a chair in God Almighty himself? And what Jesus Christ already did for you, claiming you, saying you're his, because he already paid the price. It's done. So for, for how it looked for me, when we were leaving California, we had three months from the time that we announced we were going to do this church thing, and, and we needed to fundraise in those three months so that me and my wife could do this full time for this first year so that we could do things like this and, and pour back out into our city before we even started a service. We had to fundraise. We had to fundraise $94,000 in three months in the dead center of COVID. Sure. I'll stand there. It wasn't easy. Might have well been a million. And what's, what's even nuts, man, is giving in that season for churches had gone down 70% across the board. You want me to do what, God? Raise what? And how long? Sick. Awesome. Never raised a dime in my life. Perfect. Two weeks before we left California, we had $105,000 in the bank. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crest the hill, and hopefully, God, you show up. Oh, Mike, don't worry. Son, don't worry, because two weeks before you even get to that point, I'm going to have it taken care of. But it was scary, y'all. Second Chronicles 20, I promise you I'm landing this plane. Second Chronicles 20, verse 29 through 30 says this. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, just takes one time. Just takes one time. The fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for God had given him rest on every side. Jehoshaphat goes into battle with three armies heading his way. When God was, when it was all said and done, God had his way, he had peace on every side of him. Went from having war on every side to having peace on every side. Faith is not a practical thing for a human standpoint. It's not. It's not. God's going to ask you to do some things that kind of take you out of your comfort zone, that, but that's the indication that you know you're doing it right. But I don't know about you guys, but I'm so sick of living a natural life. I'm so sick of being able to put things into my own credit. Guys, I want to live a super natural life. And what that means is it's going to supersede your own effort, your own expectation, and your own precepts and concepts. We are not smart enough to outthink God and what he wants to do in your life, every single person here, you couldn't even dream it yet. But having faith to stand there and let God do his thing, it's going to take some work. 
I really believe that when God gave me this message that he wanted to start to call people to drop their swords, drop their shields, drop fighting in their own strength and give it to him. To worship him. Actually invite him into the moment and let him show you how much he loves you. Let him show you that your efforts, your 1,160,000 person army that you have in your back pocket, your, your credibility, your education, your fortitude, your sheer willpower, it's nothing compared to his plan and what he wants to do for your life. All you got to do is stand. So if the prayer team will want to make their way up, that's what we're going to do. This song, when I was telling Pastor Aaron, man, like, this song is just in my spirit. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It looks like I'm surrounded. But I'm surrounded by you. So if you guys got some stuff in this room, man, don't wait. Why? Why wait? Why do that to yourself? Give it to God right down here and leave it. Just leave it. I'm going to pray and then we're going to pray. And we're going to open this altar up. And if there's anyone in here, man, that you guys got stuff you want to let God, you want to let go and let God, then do it now. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. God, I'm so... I'm so humbled just at who you are, God, that you would choose to care about us in big ways and in small ways. That's why I pray right now for every single person in this room. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Tear down every army and do it in ways that people haven't even thought of yet in this place. God, we love you. Jesus Christ, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we need you. Do what only you can do, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. we all stand together altars are open if you'd like prayer go ahead and make your way forward now maybe you want prayer for something that has nothing to do with what was preached you just say I, I need prayer in my life I need the Lord to touch my body maybe the message hits you maybe the message has hit you you say I'm in the middle of it and I have no idea what to do. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and make your way forward now. Don't wait. Don't worry. Come on. You don't have to, you don't have, to have a, a mindset of pride to say, I don't want anybody to know I've got problems. Can we all just be real and honest? Every single one of us, at one point or another, are walking through something. Right? Listen, if you want prayer, come on. Don't make me do the, let's close our eyes and raise our hands thing. Let's just be bold. And if you'd like somebody to pray with you today, make your way out of your chair and come now. Come on. Don't wait anymore. Come on. If you don't, I'm going to send the prayer team out to you. You're going to get prayed for one way or another. Hallelujah. Altars are open. Anybody else? Worship team's going to sing. The altars are open. Feel free to come forward. If you'd like, you say, this is how I fight my battles. 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 Bye.
This is how I find my battles. And this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battle. And this is how I find my Surrounded by you, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear me, look, I, I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you, Lord. Hear me, look, I, I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my Okay, everybody, can we take a moment? If you're willing, if you're willing, whatever posture you got to get into, we're going to say, can we just lift our hands to heaven if you're willing to do that for a moment? Every eye on Jesus. We don't worry about anything, anyone else. I'm grateful that people responded, but I am definitely sure that there are probably more who could have. I want to take a moment to pray. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person in this place who feels like they're standing against a wall and they have no idea how they're going to get through it or how they're going to get over it or how they're going to get past it. Lord, I believe what has been shared today by Brother Mike is a divine word from the Lord for some people today. So we're praying right now in Jesus' name that every person who is faced with that type of a situation, that they would, instead of looking at the army in front of them, they would look at the Creator of the universe who was over them. That each person would not look at their circumstances, but they would look at the God who holds everything in the palm of His hand. Instead of looking at how difficult things might be, we could understand that we serve the God who with one breath creates things. That with one word, galaxies come into existence. That we don't have to live a life that's afraid of anything we would face. When all it takes is one word, and the sea's parted. When all it takes is one word, and the mountain is thrown into the sea. When all it takes is one word from our God to change everything. So with our hands lifted to you, Lord, as an act, as even was talked about in the message, as an act of worship in this place right now, I pray that there would be a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit that would blow through this place. That every man, woman, boy, and girl, even the kids that are in the back for kids' church right now, would encounter your love, would encounter your presence in a real and a tangible way right now. That the weight of sin and the grind of of everything that we've done that has displeased you would start to melt off with the water of your Holy Spirit. That we would be washed afresh and anew in your power and your presence today. That the past is the past and this moment forward is your future for our lives. That the old things are gone and the new has begun. That we don't have to live in a certain way that we used to. But we can live and move forward in the new power and the new strength that you have for us every day lord thank you that your word says your mercies are new every morning so every day i get out of bed you've got new mercies for me we give you praise we give you honor and we give you glory we lift up the name of jesus the name above every name hallelujah can we give the lord a hand of praise today Come on, a real hand to play. Come on, I've heard you cheer louder in a ball game. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Because this is how I fight my battle. 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 But I'm surrounded by you. 
It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Let's sing that like yeah, we need it, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm, I'm surrounded, surrounded by you. you. Ooh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. He's right here in the midst. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yeah. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Hey. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Hey. It may look like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, yeah, it may look like I'm surrounded. By you. <laughs> hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, there's all kinds of laughing and joy. and whew. I love that. Scripture says, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. I, you might have trying times, but there's no such thing as a true Christian that's a bump on the log. The term sour puts Christian is an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. Because if you've been set free from your sin, there's joy in the Lord. Amen. Who cares what the past looks like? The Bible says the old has gone, the new has come. Right? You leave that stuff back there. It's under the blood of Jesus. Why are you trying to dig it back up? Praise God. So here's what's going to happen. The worship team's still playing. That's all well and good. We have baptisms that are going to happen in just a moment. And so what I'm going to ask is anybody that's getting baptized, if you have like a change of clothes or you have anything like that, this would be the time to start rounding that stuff up. I'm going to say a blessing and we're going to take about, we'll say 10 minutes. We'll say right at noon. It's a little less than 10 minutes. Right at noon, what's going to happen? If you want a fellowship and you're going to stick around, you're free to do that in here. If you're going to fellowship and you're going to leave, then we'll ask you to kind of hang out with each other in the hallway. Because at noon, in this room, we're going to be baptizing some people in water, and that's where our focus is going to be. I want to encourage you, there's going to be somebody at the back door with the bucket. Remember, that's your tithe and your offering. But any offering today, if you want to give that to the Orta family, if it's a check, make it to the church, put in the memo. It's for the guest speaker. Use the card machine, the guest speaker tab. If you have cash, just tell the person taking the bucket, the money at the bucket, just say, hey, this is for the guest speaker. We will make sure that that gets to the order family, okay? So we'll say a blessing over you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God bless you as you go. We're going to baptize some people here in about six or seven minutes. So God bless you. Get settled in. Or if you're leaving, God bless you as you go today.